Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to how the use of multimedia enhances teaching, learning and research. Uh, my name is Kerry Pinney, I'm Interim Chief Executive of the Association for Learning Technology. As I've mentioned already to those of you that have joined, um, if you have any questions or comments during today's webinar, please use our chat function. So that's down in the bottom right hand corner, there's a purple menu with two arrows on it. If you click on that, that'll open up the menu and you'll find the first icon in there is the um, chat icon. So if you have any comments, any questions throughout the day, please pop them in there. We will be keeping an eye on the chat throughout um, and we'll have time for questions and comments at the end. So please do pop them in there. We'll be keeping an eye on it and make sure um, that you've, uh, your question gets asked at the end of today's webinar. So welcome and, as, and our webinar today is a collaboration um, between the Association for Learning Technology and Learning on Screen. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Learning on Screen if you don't already know about Learning on Screen and we'll have um, some more um, throughout this session uh, about what Learning on Screen does, their mission and aims. But Learning on Screen is a charity and membership organisation that firmly believes that multimedia, that includes moving image and sound, is fundamental to engaging dynamic and learning um, teaching practices. Their focus is on ensuring post-16 students excel and thrive in education and their mission is to help shape the future of education. One way that Learning on Screen does this is via their platform, Boxer Broadcast, which many of you will already be familiar with. Often we call it Bob, um, and I remember using Bob many times uh, in my previous life as a, a learning technologist in universities. Bob is a resource that provides access to over 3 million on-demand broadcasts across uh, various channels, including TV programs, documentaries, and news. And Bob not only provides educators with access to its content, it also provides them with the tools to curate and seamlessly integrate content into their teaching content and practices. And it is really my pleasure to welcome and thank the team from Learning On Screen who organized our speaker for today. We're joined by Kerry Jane Packman, Learning On Screen's Chief Executive, who will be closing today's webinar and facilitating the Q&A. For Francesca Lestrade and Marianne Open as well. I also get the honour of welcoming our speaker for today, Dr Chris Wilmot. And it's a pleasure to welcome Chris um, to the Association for Learning Technology and thank him for um, his, uh, his work and uh, for everything he's going to share with us today. Chris has a long association with the University of Leicester, having studied biological sciences. He stayed on to complete a PhD on antibiotic resistance. After working for a Christian charity and as a secondary school science teacher, he returned to Leicester as a lecturer in 2000, becoming a senior lecturer in 2006. He was awarded the uh, Distinguished University Teaching Fellowship in 2003 and a National Teaching Fellowship in 2005. Away from Leicester, Chris has served as editor-in-chief of both the Bioscience and uh, the Biochemist magazine. He served a full term on the Education Committee for the Nuffield Council on Bioethics and is on the Executive Committee for Learning on Screen. Over the years, Chris's particular academic interests have been in bioethics, authentic assessment and the representation of science in broadcast media. Chris was an invited collaborate, uh, contributor sorry, to the annual Biomedical Ethics Film Festival in Edinburgh for nearly a decade. And he is an author of a number of books and book chapters on bioethics, including Where Science and Ethics Meet, Dilemmas at the Frontiers of Medicine and Biology, for which he and co-author Salvador um, Massip, apologies if that's incorrectly pronounced, were awarded the European Prize for the popularization of science in 2013. Chris retired in 2022 and now works as a freelance science communicator. He remains an honorary associate professor at Leicester and a keen enthusiast for the benefits of multimedia in education. Chris, a huge thank you from me for joining us today and to the Learning on Screen team for inviting you along to uh, present today. So when you're ready, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Kerry. And good uh, morning, everyone. So um, I will be swapping over onto my slides in a moment. Here we go. Just uh, double check that everyone can uh, see those and can hear me. Kerry, is that fine? Yep, all good, can see and hear right. you and your slides are up. 
Great, good. Thank you uh, again. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, so um, uh, as has been said already, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the use of multimedia in teaching, uh, learning and research. And to give a bit of an outline of where I hope we're going to go in the next half hour or so, uh, I could talk a bit about the rationale for using broadcast media in teaching. I could illustrate that with some examples from my own practice. Uh, talk about ways in which you can share some of these materials with, with a wider group of people using viewing lists, playing lists, and the potential for blogging as well. Uh, and then uh, move finally in my section on to talking about research involving broadcast media and, and the potential for use of Bob in that uh, before going on uh, to the Q&A, which as was said before, Kerry Jane will be, um, will be moderating for us. When we think about use of television in university teaching, I guess a lot of people will default to thinking about the classic 1970s, early 1980s, um, in open university type type model, uh, as, as caricatured here in the uh, Harry and Paul story of the twos uh, sketch. I'm not going to play the clip for now. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to, partly to save time, I'm not going to show any of the clips except for one. Uh, that I'm going to, to talk about in, in the rest of the uh, the presentation. Uh, but I've put some URLs down in case people want to look these up in, in, in the future. And just on that, uh, this isn't POW IOU, it's Paul OU uh, at the bottom. So it's one of those ones when, when it's only when you type it out that you realize uh, that you should have chosen a different uh, short acronym. Uh, so uh, yeah, so people think about the open university type model uh, and there's, uh, you probably all experience this as well um, in general terms with learning technology. There's a certain reticence amongst uh, academics to use different tools and technologies. And with regard to, to media, I think there are several of those. Uh, one of them is that the content is not sufficiently academic. Uh, so certainly when I was presenting about a, a related project at a conference a number of years ago, one of the delegates said uh, TV science is dumbed down science. Now. Um, some of it is, uh, let's be perfectly honest, some, some of it is, a lot of it is not, and certainly a lot of radio coverage uh, is really very good indeed. Um, but even where something is a bit dumbed down, um, as I hope I'm going to demonstrate later on, we can make educational use of that uh, in, in a session. Uh, so uh, secondly, people are worried about technology failing. Again, something I'm sure uh, you as learning technologists will be very familiar with. Um, people might feel there's insufficient time in the curriculum. We uh, get more and more things occurring, the, uh, particularly in my field of bioscience. The, uh, the frontiers of biology and medicine move forward year on year at such a pace uh, that you, you can't possibly be putting more things in. The argument's all about, well, what do we drop out, rather than saying, well, let's put some more things in. Uh, there's concerns about copyright, and um, uh, some of those are, are legitimate and valid and, and important. So it, it is. Um, helpful when, when academics have got that on their radar. People perhaps can't see the way in which media would be useful to, to add to their, to their course. And even if they were, they might be uncertain what was available and where they could find it. So I want to argue this morning uh, that actually AV can be used in a number of useful ways. We can promote engagement, um, watching, listening to things is something that students are very familiar with doing. Uh, so uh, it's not an alien uh, met method for them to be uh, to be picking up information. I think about, um, in particular, my, my sons who are now both, um, well, uh, have, have done PhDs, in one case is doing a PhD in, in the other. They have, since a young age, turned to things like YouTube videos for how to do uh, anything rather than look it up in a book. So they're used, they're used to this kind of format. Uh, we can use AV to illustrate a particular theory or a technique. Uh, it would be one thing to talk about it, but all the better if we can actually demonstrate something to the students. It may be that there's other content that we want to convey, that actually that uh, somebody spent an awful lot of money producing a short package that explains something very clearly, so why not benefit from that as well? It could be that we want to set a broader context, a framework in which we want to then um, and uh, exp explore a particular topic in more details, or as a discussion starter, or actually for the benefit of uh, media criticism or, or science communication itself, and look at some of the ways in which people are conveying information 
and what we can learn from that. So we've actually had Bob introduced already. Uh, this was my uh, question. I was going to say, um, who's Bob? I, I put this up partly to remind me that uh, although um, I, many of us, uh, including myself, have worked with a number of other multimedia uh, platforms. Um, for example, I've done some work uh, using lecture capture technology for things other than recording lectures. Um, but today we're going to focus particularly on thinking about Bob. And uh, as we know already, uh, Bob is not in fact a who, it's a what. But if you, if you Google Bob, this is uh, some of the main things that you get up uh, to begin with. So what's Bob? Again, uh, Kerry's introduced some of this already. Uh, so Bob is learning on screens, on demand, uh, TV and radio service uh, for UK uh, higher education in particular. Uh, and it is a membership service. So in that sense, um, institutions have to be members, but most UK HEIs are members. It's just a lot of academics don't know that. And I think that's one of the key things which uh, I think we need to kind of try and share is actually the existence of uh, Boxer Broadcast and the potential that it's got uh, for people. There are now something in excess of 3 million broadcasts and uh, around about 65 uh, channels that are, are, are recordable um, from, from the service. So we've got a very large database then of um, materials that can then be, be utilized. Uh, there is actually a connection to one of the Bobs on the previous slide. So I have it on good authority from those who were there at the time that the name Bob was actually an homage originally to the Blackadder character, Bob, um, uh, otherwise known as either Kate or, or Driver, um, Driver Parkhurst. And uh, that uh, that was a, the name that was used for the system in the first place. And the longer name box of broadcast was actually retrofitted to that at a later stage. Um, Take that as, uh, as as you may. So um, why use Bob? What is it that Bob is bringing that perhaps is different to some of the other uh, resources that we've got available? Uh, one of the important things is provenance. So the materials that are in Bob are copyright cleared for use in, in education. And that's important in comparison with some of the other places where we might find materials, uh, but they haven't actually been authorized for use in the ways that we want them to, to be used. So Bob it is okay in that regard. I've mentioned already that it's extensive, uh, more than 3 million programs, uh, several uh, tens of, 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 of cha uh, channels that are being recorded. Persistence and consistency I put here because uh, once something is in Bob, it's in Bob, it's not going away. And that's very important when we compare, for example, with if people were using something from YouTube or from some other sources. Uh, one of the things that many of us have learned the, the hard way uh, with online resources uh, is that um, at the drop of a hat, your favorite uh, platform, your favorite service, uh, Delicious is one that springs to mind in my case, suddenly that is gone and it's no longer there. But Bob is, Bob is there and, the, and the, the episodes are going to remain there. And they can be streamed. Uh, so um, again, I'll mention one particular example of this later on, but not so long ago, if you wanted to share audiovisual media with, with students, uh, you would perhaps have one or more copies of a DVD available in the library and students would need to borrow it from you there. Uh, streaming allows for the potential for more students to be watching more materials in their own time. Uh, and that opens up some of the pedagogic opportunities that I'll talk about in a second. You can use Bob to make particular clips from within something that you want to, 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 to address. And then you can tag um, program so you can add them to playlists and that's something I'll talk about a bit more later on and finally there's the searchability of Bob so um, both Bob and the companion service Trilt which I'll, again I'll mention briefly later on uh, can be can be searched so you can look through these for uh, materials that you think might be helpful uh, in, in your teaching or the teaching of those that you're helping OK, so I'm going to just talk through a few examples. I say in most cases, I'm not going to show the clip in question, but these are illustrative of some of the kinds of uses I was talking about just now. So to begin with, uh, a, a clip from a documentary. Uh, I mean, many episodes in my context, many episodes of Horizon are, are great in, the, in their entirety. But in this particular case, uh, a lecture introducing students to um, 
to uh, pharmaceutical design, to thinking about uh, clinical trials, to thinking about how medicines are developed, I could tell them that uh, companies have data banks of millions of compounds and they go to them randomly and uh, start to find things which will be lead compounds for then developing in, into further tests. Um, I could tell them about that so much the better if I can show the two minute clip uh, from this episode of Horizon in which uh, the GlaxoSmithKline robot is seen working its way along the shelves, taking some of these two million or more bottles off the shelf and taking them so they can be used in a particular experiment. They talk about some of the rationale of that. So that's better than just describing it to them. Secondly, as a scene set, I'm going to give two couple of different examples here. Uh, this is one from the film Die Another Day. Uh, two separate clips uh, from within the film. Uh, in the one that's shown in the image there, uh, Bond is explaining to M that he's discovered that there is a service being offered uh, where they're offering gene therapy as a way of changing people's identity. Um, in the particular, um, in, in, in the context of the film, uh, the uh, I think he's Korean, some Korean army officer gets um, turned into a British aristocrat by using this technique. Now, um, absolute nonsense. Um, and you can reinforce the nonsense of it by going to the second clip, which is where the scientist who carries out these beauty treatments uh, tells Halle Berry that you take DNA from runaways, people who won't be missed, and uh, you know it's, it's it's great to work on such a marvelous person as you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, utter nonsense. Um, but it does help to say that's not what gene therapy is. What is gene therapy, and, and what kind of things are possible instead? So again, just as a scene setter. Secondly, um, I mentioned just now talking about uh, pharmaceuticals. So. In a session thinking about um, the way in which uh, research is being done with microorganisms, there are so-called containment levels uh, that you uh, can are restricted to work in depending on the uh, on the risk factors associated with a particular uh, organism. And at the start of the film, outbreak, uh, they they walk the audience through the development of the four. Uh, safety levels that people are looking at. Now, it's it's an American context, but the, the levels are pretty similar in both uh, here in the UK. It's not 100% accurate, um, but it's, it is very good. It's very uh, helpful in, in kind of setting the scene. And one of the things that it's not good at, uh, again, is something that you can ask the students to look at in, in more detail. So, um, for example, in two of the settings, including attainment level three, uh, containment level three, um, the workers remove their PPE before they leave the, the room. So you can, students always spot that um, in, the, in watching it. What I want to talk to in slightly more detail is this. So uh, what we're gonna just think about now is a 50 minute session that I've run with students for a number of years, uh, thinking about experimental design. And so um, the questions I put on the screen here now, are because I would like you to think about these as well, whilst we, we show this, this one clip, in a moment. And so um, the, um, the we, we show the clip and ask the students to think about what's good about the experiment that's, that's been shown, what's uh, wrong with the experiment, and then we move on to think a bit about how they could perhaps do a different uh, experiment. So the, uh, the clip is from Brainiac Science Abuse. Okay, um, so we haven't got opportunity to, to do much in the way of uh, kind of group work without organizing breakout groups, and that wasn't wor worth it for this particular purpose. But just perhaps um, to be thinking for yourselves for just literally uh, a minute or two, um, what were some of the good things about the experiment that was shown there? And uh, what are some of the things that were wrong with the way that that experiment was being done? And then I'll, I'll explain what we did with this activity in, in the session.
Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to talk us through this uh, for the purposes, as I said, this will be part of a, a 50 minute uh, session usually. Um, in terms of uh, good aspects of the brainiac, ex brainiac experiment, um, there weren't many, uh, but uh, they did include a negative control. So somebody who was neither fear nor sport. So that was a good feature. Uh, all the subjects carried out their activity for the same amount of time. And all the subjects were sniffed by the same person and all subjects were the same gender. So that's pretty much the extent of good things about the experiment. Uh, in terms of things that were wrong, uh, there was only one sniffer. So um, that was a very limited uh, population. And likewise, there's only three people who were the sweaters in the uh, experiment. Uh, it wasn't the same person who was on the crane running or relaxing at different points in time. You might have noticed that the distance from the nose to the armpit was different in the various cases. In one case, the guy didn't even lift his arm up. Um, and there could have been other explanations for the observed phenomenon. So perhaps there have been different usage of uh, deodorant. Perhaps they had differences in natural body odor. Perhaps somebody eaten smelly foods the day before. And then you've got physiological features like olfactory fatigue or adaptation that could have occurred. So a number of things, the limitations of the experiment and students are very good at picking most of these out uh, as they watch, watch the clip. I then asked them to think a bit about uh, with, their, with their neighbors. And again, we won't have time to do this today, but think with their neighbors about how they could um, design a better experiment to, to smell fear. And the beauty of this is that actually uh, around about the same time, there was a, a proper scientific publication that had looked at this particular phenomenon. As it turns out, um, you apparently as, as a participant couldn't know that you'd smelt fear, but they detected in the brain uh, some changes. So it's something which they, they, they termed uh, empathy contagion uh, as a phenomenon. And if you want to know more about that particular one, it was written up in the Journal of Biological Education um, back in uh, 2011. OK, so two examples now of full programs. I'll just move through this slightly more, more swiftly. Um, the, uh, the, the, there was a three part series uh, run by Adam Rutherford um, called The Cell. The second part of those is on the experiments that showed that DNA was uh, the molecule of life, if you like. So a uh, very good episode, 60 minutes long. Uh, lecture slots are 50 minutes, so you can see a problematic clash there straight away. So I needed a double lecture slot. Originally, when I used to run this, um, I, I ran it off a DVD, which was um, kind of pre-Bob um, pre days. And it also was one that was under particular legislation for the Open University, because it was an Open University co-production. So that also is something that Bob has uh, helped, helped through. Secondly, Storyville. Um, so this is a 90 minute documentary. It probably remains my favorite science documentary of recent years. It really is an exceptional program looking at the capacities for changing people's genomes that we now uh, are on the cusp of having as a, a sort of thing that, that can be done. Um, so great program, clearly not showable in an hour's context. And in fact, Alongside the difficulty of fitting those into the timetable, the question could be raised, is that the most appropriate use of face-to-face -face time? So that's one of the issues um, that, that's addressed by using Bob instead, because it opens up the opportunity of flipped learning. We can require students to watch things before a session, and it also raises the possibility of viewing lists. OK, uh, I actually took that activity, uh, the one based on the Storyville story, and developed uh, uh, some interactive questions for the students to use as part of our lockdown teaching. So I produced a guide that the students would use with that and some questions, and they were intentionally of a variety of styles. Some were simply content recall, uh, had people picked up from the video the relevant topic. Uh, some required additional reading. Some required rephrasing of some of the content in order to demonstrate understanding, and others involved different higher order thinking skills. Then in terms of sharing materials, um, most module leads will be developing some kind of reading list. And in this day and age, those are no longer kind of paper-based lists. Those are lists which are more likely to be um, held electronically and possibly provided via the library. 
it is feasible to develop viewing lists that go alongside a reading list. Um, and so um, we could again, we could have something that was a necessary viewing before a tutorial, or it might be something that said, if you're particularly interested in this topic, you could watch this as, as an extra. And one thing when you're when people are developing modules, um, there are so many hours that are supposed to be associated with the credits for a module. Often, in my experience, that leads to packing out a certain amount of the program with guided independent study. And here is a classic example of something that is, could, is or could be guided independent study. You're recommending things that people could, could view. In terms of setting these up for a particular module in a particular institution, uh, I think the uh, the the um, TALIS Chrome plugin. So most universities, again, are using the, the reading list service provided by TALIS. Uh, if you were to go to this um, URL here, you can get the TALIS extension. And, and what that means is that when you then are looking at a program within Bob, you get a little uh, extra additional button. And if you click on that, it can put that straight into a reading list for your module. And so uh, in, in Best Blue Peter, style here's one I prepared earlier so I prepared this earlier in the week particularly for this demonstration now so um we've got um that episode of gene revolution I talked about which I've labeled as essential uh the chemistry for life that I talked about essential and then an episode of uh, extra life about vaccines uh, something about antibiotics and just for difference there a radio documentary about Dorothy Hodgkin which I put down there as background or, or possible additional reading and it was very easy to, to develop that within uh, the, the the TALIS system however um, within Bob itself there's the opportunity to develop playlists and these are very useful for sharing things more broadly than an institution although you could use them still within an institution as well and um, one of the things I like about this and my recommendation for people would always be to, to add a program to as many playlists as they thought was appropriate. Uh, and that's really because, to my mind, this, this sort of tagging or playlist is to enable us to rediscover things at a later stage. And so this particular list here, uh, from biology and broadcast media down to liquid biopsy, all refer to a radio program, an episode of Inside Health about liquid biopsies, which are a way of um, diagnosing cancer. So that's uh, something that uh, I think is a, is a very useful way of using the playlists. And then also since uh, 2020, uh, there have been a number of curated playlists. Now there's over a hundred of these now. And um, the additional advantage that you get with these is often there's a little video that's been uh, specifically made to explain what the playlist is about. Uh, here's uh, my own one, uh, but actually uh, there's a better example. Uh, this one here, uh, classical music in films. And the reason I say this is a better example is that you've got at the bottom here access to teaching activities and uh, Jonathan uh, Godsell at Royal Holloway has done a great job here um, listing uh, the episodes that have been used in the playlist and then for each of those is a drop down menu where he's added some additional information so a short video and or some notes and or um, a link to, a, to further references that you could look up on that particular topic. So a really uh, top quality way of using those playlists. Uh, I saw a question pop up earlier about, um, can people access Bob overseas? Now that is an important and very uh, current question because the standard ERA license doesn't allow for uh, things to be played outside of the UK. But there is a pilot project on at the moment and more people are welcome to, to join this in which um, playlists that have been prepared by an academic can be shared with students on UK courses overseas. That could be students studying abroad, or it could be students who are enrolled in a UK course, but are currently studying in their own country for perhaps the first or second, first one or two years of that, of that course. And it's as simple as clicking a button on, on the playlist to do that. There are a couple of restrictions that apply. Uh, there's an exemption for films produced since 2000. They can't be included in the global project and, and a warning to be careful about culturally sensitive materials. And then finally on this, I mentioned uh, the opportunities for blogging. And so um, uh, I think um, 
there's scope for using blogs as a way of expanding the amount of information that you're able to to share and of course there there is a potential audience out there who's interested in the subject but hasn't necessarily got access to bob and some of the clips uh, would be available via other sources as well via uh, sounds or iPlayer and so on and so um i've been using this as a way of sharing details about programs and it's also added opportunity for collaboration so this was a project that um, um, predated the, the, the Bob playlists, uh, started in September 2014. And just to flick through some examples of the kind of posts that we've got there, um, some are simply raising awareness that a resource exists. So uh, in the intervening period since I made this original post, um, the BBC has produced The Green uh, Planet, which is a more recent series about David Atter on plants, but they're still excellent content from a very old series, originally shown in 1995, but it was repeated on BBC Two later on and is therefore available uh, within Bob. Others are examples where I've added notes, for, uh, uh, study uh, guide notes. There could be clips from within a programme, or again, here, there's my old friend, the, the smell of, uh, can you smell fear, popping up with structured activity. Um, it could be something that is a new story. So here's one from a couple of weeks ago about uh, use of genetics to improve hop varieties. On the right hand side here, you'll notice there's no date. I, we tend to try and include uh, the same information about each clip, but this was a, uh, um, uh, an amalgamation, if you like, of different clips about the O'Neill report, antimicrobial resistance, which got a lot of news coverage at the time and actually features uh, my one appearance on the BBC is buried in there as well. And then um, just to, to raise the possibilities both of radio programs, but also reposting things that have come from elsewhere. So uh, we had written a longer post on a, on a companion site, uh, Bioethics Bites, about Rise of Planet of the Apes. And so that was something that was used there. Um, I was fortunate to get some funding, which allowed us to get students to write blog posts. I uh, got that from the University of Audiovisuals in the Disciplines, the AVID project. Uh, so these are examples of posts written by students. And I also had some interns for a while as well. So again, some posts written by uh, some of those. And finally, some posts written by colleagues from other universities, uh, examples here, one from Exeter and one from Leeds, and, and just demonstrating this was a resource for a broader community. There, um, we did, with, as part of the AVID project, also get the opportunity to develop some other projects as, as well, other subject-specific uh, blog sites. So we have Astrophysics on the Box, English on the box and history on the box. But as is commonly the case with things like blogging, all of those are currently mothballed because the relevant people have moved on or their time has been squeezed out by other uh, uh, necessary contributions. So uh, demonstrating both the potential but the limitations of that type of approach. Uh, and again, there's more um, written about that particular project on this um, uh, link to the, uh, the Alt-C blog. Okay, um, research. Finally, just to talk about a few research possibilities, there are some formal learning on screen research projects underway using Bob. One of those is, as we mentioned, looking at overseas usage and the potential for that. Another is looking at the transcripts that are available from programs as a way of training uh, AI for, for future uses. But there are also the possibilities of developing your own projects as well. And I mentioned earlier the, um, the TRIL, which is the Television and Radio Index for Learning and Teaching. I think most people uh, on the call will be uh, familiar with Bob, perhaps fewer with TRIL, but it really is an excellent resource as well. But if I'm honest, it looks a bit at the moment like we're trying to hide uh, this, this great nugget under, a, under a, a, a bush of some sort. So it's quite hard to find. You actually need to go onto the, the Bob site and then log into your own account at the beginning. And that is because there are, is some content within Trill that is personalized to your account. So if you know, it makes logical sense to, to, to find it there, but it, there's actually no way of seeing it until you've logged in to your account, at which point you can then get this uh, separate archive Trilt, uh, which overlaps with Bob in terms of the content, but is not based on transcripts and so on, but is based on um, other metadata that's available with the program but also includes as well other things like the Radio Times Index, the Shakespeare Index and things can be linked uh, from that. So it is worth investigating that if you're not familiar with it. 
I first used um, Bob in a, in a research context as, with final year dissertations, setting students non-lab projects looking with titles such as the ones that we've got on the screen here. The last of those uh, then actually turned into a PhD project and the PhD student and one of the other students had, had done exceptional work in developing the methodologies to use with this. And so um, the aim really here is to develop something where uh, broadcast media is as, as accessible for research as print media is. So it's become long established that print media via tools such as LexisNexis and Factiva can be used to, um, uh, to, to, to research things. And now for the first time really, Bob represents a boundary collection of broadcast material, which can be analyzed in a similar way. And this is just to say, just to emphasize the fact that uh, TV viewing remains an important thing in people's lives. Some of the parameters you might set, some of these are obvious, um, but there's there's complexity within it. Uh, the dates, you might want to, to, you're likely to want to have a range of dates, perhaps they'll be centered around or start with a particular key event. Will you look at TV, radio, or both? Uh, will you look at all channels or just particular ones? What genres will you think about drama, documentary, uh, and what tools? Will you just use Bob? Will you use Trilt? Or, or will you use both? And some of those kind of questions are things that we've built into a guide available for doing this. It's on the Learning on Screen website. Those two links are the same there. I thought the first one was quite long, so I've, I've made a tiny URL for, for Bob for research at the bottom. And the sections within that guide are, are illustrated here. So um, some of the questions I was just raising there are in the conducting your search uh, section, but we also then think about uh, ways in which the data can be uh, handled, refined, and, and so on. So um, again, I recommend that to you. And that really brings me to the end of my bit of the presentation, slightly running towards the end there because I was conscious that we're against the clock. Um, but uh, thank you for your attention. If people would like to get in touch, I'll leave this slide up uh, for the time being. Uh, email address, uh, some of the details of some of those uh, sources, uh, ways of getting in touch with me are listed here. And uh, if you'd like me to, to be perhaps um, doing some work with some of your own academics, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that as well. So I'll hand back to, uh, to, to Kerry and Kerry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kerry Jane uh, Patman. I'm the CEO of Learning On Screen. That was absolutely fascinating, uh, Chris. And um, thank you very much for delivering that. Uh, this is the opportunity for us to put you on the spot and to ask you any questions. Um, so I know there are some questions that have come through. Um, there's been a lot around um, the uh, uh, off uh, the offshore students uh, pilot and whether Bob is accessible um, around that. I wonder whether a member of my team could put a link into the chat around where um, people can go and sign up and find out more about that. That would be really helpful. But Chris, is there anything else that you wanted to expand on that as you're a part of the working group as well? Um, so I, I, not in particular, I think on, on that aspect, Kerry, just really to raise people's uh, awareness of it. I mean, I think um, for a while people have been uh, conscious that that uh, for copyright reasons, um, Bob was only available in the UK. And we know that there's a growing number of ways in which there are students who are overseas, either on a placement year or a study abroad uh, semester, or people uh, who are on uh, you know these these kind of three or four year programs where they do a first kind of three or four year programs where they do a first bit overseas and um, uh, this now gives legitimate way to, to use those. Uh, so I would encourage people to to sign up and think about uh, doing that. Uh, again, um, it has to be an academic curated playlist, uh, but it could be, for example, that if you made a playlist that was tagged around a particular module code, so in my case, kind of BS 3068 or something, that that could be used as a, a, an anchor point for, for collating resources that students could then uh, watch, watch for that. Fantastic. Um, it's a really exciting uh, project for us because it's been something that members have been asking for for a, a long while. So uh, working with ERA very closely on that is, um, is fantastic. In terms of, there has been um, a couple of questions around uh, the links to the learning management systems 
and whether uh, Boxer Broadcast Bob links to learning management systems. You mentioned uh, Talis um, of one of the learning management systems um, and how that links in. I suppose, it, do you have any experience of any others that link with uh, Boxer Broadcast? Um, so um, we've been a, a Blackboard based institution and, and it's possible to put links within there. The thing I would say is that um, you do still need then to to click through that link. And so um, the student or whoever else is looking will need to sign on uh, to their own Bob account when they when they've gone through through that link uh, to, to the to the episode. So um, it won't run automatically for them just by having a an embed there. OK, and just something for us as a, an organisation, we're constantly looking at improvements for Bob and all of our platforms. So I know integrations with learning management systems is something that is on our agenda to look at over the, um, the coming uh, months uh, as we develop further. I'm really sorry about this one because there's an acronym in it and I'm not sure what the acronym is. So if you can't answer it, Chris, my apologies, okay. but can Bob be used for the MBCHB program or is it focused on more generalized HE programs? Okay, so MBCHB is a medical program, so that's Thank uh, the you. Med medicine <laughs> courses. Um, and uh, so, yeah, no, pe people absolutely can use um, um, this in, in, in medical. I mean, clearly, a lot of television output is medical in, in, in content, so you've got. Uh, I, I know people who are using uh, House, for example, episodes of House for uh, random weird diagnoses, or um, people are using other clips of um, more more serious uh, science do documentaries or news stories. So I, I think medicine is actually one of the areas where it's it's super rich for um, piece. I've noticed in the, in the, Scrubs is good, says Kath yes. in, the, in the chat. There. So yeah, so there's there's plenty of use uh, and potential for medicine, absolutely. Fantastic. One of the comments that did come through that made me made me laugh when you were doing about the experiment uh, uh, around that was the ethics of terrifying someone. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, that, I think that would be a useful in, uh, thing to include. Um, you know, so the purpose of that session is to think about experimental design and ethical aspects of that would would be something there. And uh, you know, so intentionally fear of putting somebody. Um, so you could get into whole questions of informed consent and those kind of things within that. Um, you know, the guy uh, clearly playing it up, but crying out to be let down, you know, the <laughs> non-response of letting him down. You've got um, a pretty mis misogynistic approach to the, having the, your, your one female sniffer going through. So there's all sorts of things that could be discussed around about that, um, as well as core things of experimental design. Fantastic. Uh, there is a comment around LTI would be great. Uh, search and embedded direct from the LMS. I okay, so I need, uh, um, someone's uh, unpacked that as learning tool interoperability. I'm afraid that's yeah. outside my um, area of knowledge. Yeah, um, I think that is something that we can um, come back to. It seems to be around uh, embedding the uh, amazing for analytics uh yeah yeah and no, i'm just i'm just reading the well. comment there to, the, to that regard so i mean that yes the, the the um i think that is an important question so it's one of the things that um for example some of the the panopto type lecture capture systems allow you to, to know which students have watched how many students have watched a, 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 a lecture um uh, how much of it they watched and, and those those kind of things and when they when they watched it so that kind of analytics is is very useful so um, uh, we know with many of the concerns with flip teaching is that actually people don't participate in the in the the bits that you've required them to do before you get to a session. So um, those kind of analytical tools would be a, a useful addition, but um, I'm not a coder, I'm afraid. No, me neither. Um, please put further questions in the chat. In the meantime, Chris, I've got a question for you, um, and it's around um, you. You've been teaching for. Um, a, a number of years. Um, Bless and you for, 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 for fudging that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, introduced like uh, audio visual into your teaching. 
do you think that you get a better response from students um, through having that interaction? Um, I think it certainly uh, doesn't. I think yeah, you know, we, you, you get um, in sessions where you are using something like this as, as a discussion starter. You, you do get a good uh, a good response. Um, you know, I, I I had a good reputation as a as a lecturer and things, so uh, I think some of this would fit with that. So um yeah i haven't got hard and fast data you know in terms of testimony that says you were rubbish until you used a video clip and then it, 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 it. <laughs> um i wasn't expecting that is there any more questions from anyone uh just give you the last opportunity to kind of um come in we've got one around uh can uh VPNs are becoming commonly used. If a student abroad points their VPN to the London server, would they be able to view Bob clips? That's out of my remit, but we could definitely come back, uh, get back to that person that's asked that, that question. Um, and also there's been a question around, can universities in other, uh, in other countries like Sweden get membership? Um, so we do have an associate membership level where you can have certain access, but access to Bob wouldn't be uh, part of that. So I think we've probably come to the end of the questions. Chris, is there anything that you want to kind of add as a final point before I close? Just, uh, I think that the, the, the point I raised uh, really about um, the number of, uh, colleagues in you know that I read, read in the biosciences who are just not aware of, of Bob and I think that that's true for a lot of um, academics so I think um, learning technologists could be one of the people who have an important role in institutions in just raising the the awareness of the potential for Bob and um, as I mentioned in uh, at the end of the talk you know I'm, I'm happy if people want to, to talk with me further about that or to, to get me involved in trying to help then I'm, I'm happy to do so. Thank you Chris so Thank you, Chris, um, and also uh, thank you, Kerry and ALT for having us today. Um, Bob is uh, something that uh, we are very passionate about in the organisation because it enables us to, as Kerry was saying in the beginning, to really get our message out that all, uh, moving image and sound is just as important as the written word um, in post-16 education. And we're really championing that as we go forward. We're constantly looking at ways to improve our box of broadcast um, for a, a platform as well as our other platforms. And I think it's important to recognise you mentioned, Chris, around like copyright as well, that we do copyright training. So if there's anything that you're unsure about, we can answer questions around that. So um, there if you are a member there's been a couple of comments in the session around uh, where can you get more information so if you are a member the team are going to put a link a link in there so that you can uh, find out more about our amazing benefits that are coming this year if you're not a member there will also be a link going in the chat that you can complete to try out bob for free um, so that um, we will give you a demo and you can have a look at that and have a poke around and see whether that is beneficial um, to you. Um, I think it's been absolutely fantastic to have you here today.